Greetings, everybody. Welcome. There's a little surprise for you to start things off today. Welcome. It's good to see you out there. I can see you right there. You're right there. I'm looking right at you. I can also see your names. Welcome to the stream today. There's uh, Kelly out there. Good to see you. Jackie. There's Big Dave. Gingerfish is with us. Uh, likewise, we'll have a uh, lovely summer. We'll be in the chat with you. If you'd like to send us a question, a complaint, whatever, you can address that to uh, Summer in the live chat um, and let us know if you got a question about what we're going to talk about today, something in general that has to do with generally what we talk about here. At the end of the show, we'll get into that, and uh, she'll share those with me. So uh, address those to Summer in the live chat, and uh, there's Leah, there's Colton and Susie Q. Everybody's showing up. Everybody's here today. I don't have a poll question for you today because I wanted to jump right into our study. For those of you who don't know, those of you who might be new here, Thursday is the day where we go in and we study. We learn. We do it together. And today, now, for, for the past, this is the 14th week we've been in the Gospel of John, and we're asking the question, who is Jesus? We want to know who he is. So how do we find that out? Well, let's just, let's just take, take his words. Let's take what he's told us. Who did Jesus say he was? Who did those who were with him say he was? And today we're in chapter 9, where Jesus gives sight to a man born blind. We're going to deal with generational curses. It's going to come up here again today, so we have to go right at it. Not shy away from it. Let's talk about it and find out. Uh, is it true? Is it true that people can be cursed from their, by their family members? Uh, you know, there are scripture, there are passages that uh, uh, would seem to say this, but is that what's being said? We're going to break that down, and uh, our goal today is that you come away from this today with a strong understanding of what is meant in the Bible by, this, by the, uh, the sins of the Father, you know, for three or four generations. What's meant by that? And of course, we want to come away from this with a stronger understanding of who Jesus Christ is. That's the question we're asking. Who is Jesus? Uh, according to God's Word. Not according to the New Agers. He's not an ascended master. He's the Savior. He is God in the flesh. So we're building high Christology. That's what we're here to do today. It's good to see you guys out there. Let's see what we have for you. By the way, the song you heard at the opening, that is uh, Reformation... 500. That is a uh, Tim Bushong. I shared the link in the chat just a moment ago. Um, that is the hymn, A Mighty Fortress, um, written by Martin Luther and performed here in a pretty inspiring way by Tim Bushong. You can uh, find that information uh, if you follow the link that I put in there to the, uh, you can download the song for free. I'll see if I can drop that into the chat as well. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. Sometimes these links are crazy long. No, it's too long. If you go to the uh, to, to the link that I put in the chat just a minute ago, in the description to the video for the song, you'll find where you can actually download that song. There it is. I put it in the chat for you again. All right. Now let's get busy. Let's get down with what we've got to do today. And we do, as always, ask that you would pray that this is not about me, that the one speaking to you today is uh, that, that, that God would be present with us and edify us all, that we would learn together. Always pray for the one who's speaking to you that God's will would be done, not mine or not whoever it might be that's speaking. And uh, we always need your prayers. All right, so as, it, uh, as we start out today, let me remind you guys about armoroftruth.net. We have, there is a new, I'll just show you right here too. We put out a community post yesterday. We have a new statement on religious exemption from one of our viewers. You can check this out. There you go. Thanks to Cameron for sharing that with us, the one he put together. Uh, excellent and excellent. So now on our website, we have about half a dozen different statements on religious exemption that you can use as examples to create your own 
All right, so uh, here's the link. Go to armoroftruth.net. I'll just show you how to get there. If you go to the website, go here. Just uh, scroll down on the website right here to the Culture Vault. And it's the, it's the first article up there, Religious Exemption Statement Number 6. All right, click on that title. And then you'll see a link down here to a PDF. And there it is. And there is the example that uh, Cameron has worked hard to put together for us. This is with not just a statement, but with citations, okay? References for all the claims that are made in here. All right, and it's, it's excellent work, so we appreciate Cameron uh, sharing that with us, allowing us to share it with you if you might need to use this or to use it as a, as a guide for your own statement that you might have to use. All right, so check that out. Please, folks, if you would like to receive a Bible and a starter pack of tracks, you can do that very easily by emailing us at hello at armoroftruth.net. Email us at hello at armoroftruth.net and tell us in the subject line, I want a Bible, and uh, we'll send one out to you. Make sure, though, that you give us your mailing address, your physical mailing address, so that we can, so we know where to send the thing. All right, there we go. Hello at armoroftruth.net. You can also uh, send us questions, comments, complaints. Uh, you can reach out to us in any way you like at hello at armoroftruth.net, but you can also request a free Bible. It's my favorite thing to do around here. One of my favorite things to do is to send those out, and um, we've sent out... I don't know, a couple dozen this month so far. So we'd love to, we'd love for that to grow. If you'd like to uh, write us, send us something through snail mail, you can do that by writing us at Armor of Truth, PO Box 729, Hudson, North Carolina, 28638. You can send us support that way if you check, money, order, whatever kind of instrument. Just make it payable to Armor of Truth and mail it to PO Box 729, Hudson, North Carolina. So there you go. Don't forget about that statement of reli uh, real on religious exemption. All right, uh, you can find that at armoroftruth.net under the Culture Vault, or you can go to the Community tab and follow that link right there. All right, all right, folks. Thanks for being with us today. This is, and always has been, my favorite part of the week. So as we jump into Gospel of John chapter nine today. Now, I think uh, in, uh, typically what I've done in the past, I would like read the whole chapter, and then we would go through it uh, bit by bit. I don't know. We've got we've only got 40 verses today, so let's do that today. Let's, you know, we've got 59 or 60 verses. It doesn't really work so well, but let's do that today. Let's read the whole thing and then come back and go through it bit by bit. Let me give you an outline of what we're going to look at today. Well, of course, a man blind from birth is healed what's interesting about a man being healed who was blind from birth this is the only example of a cure of this type in other words there was no possibility of fraud here that's why that one's interesting one of the reasons why it's interesting not, not the only reason of course but one of the reasons and so jesus is also dealing here with the hard-hearted skeptics that are the Pharisees. So he has to respond to them. The man who was healed has to respond to the Pharisees. The man's parents have to respond to the Pharisees. And then we're going to obviously, as I mentioned, get into generational curses. Does a son bear any responsibility for the sins of the father? What do you think? If I had put, the, if I had put a poll question together today, that probably would have been the question I would have asked. And so we'll, uh, I think we'll probably get through the whole chapter today with, with this one. If not, we'll finish it up next week. We like to take our time with this. Also, a special topic today we'll look at is healing. Healing and, and uh, faith. Healing and faith and your imagination. There are some people out there today teaching that you need to... Uh, that you need to pay attention to your imagination, that you need to use your imagination to grow your faith. People who call themselves Christians are doing that. 
and it's sometimes it's so it well sometimes it's so subtle that it's difficult for uh, the Christian who maybe hasn't uh, studied his or her Bible closely enough where you might not know the difference between these people. So we're going to help you out with that too. All right, so um, there was controversy surrounding this healing, of course. The, uh, the parents of the, the, the man that was healed were afraid to even defend his honor in front of the Pharisees. We also see the, de the development of the man who was healed. We see the development of his faith in this process. So we're going to look at all, uh, also a special topic of faith, belief, and trust. How is faith mentioned in the Old Testament and the New Testament? With a lot of other special topics as we get on through this. Now, let's go over here. John chapter 9. As he passed by, he saw... A man blind from birth and his disciples talked about Jesus as Jesus passed by he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him teacher rabbi who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind Jesus answered it was not that this man sinned or his parents but that the works of God might be displayed in him we must work the works of him who sent me while it's day night is coming when no one can work as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of, Silo of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, and the man called Jesus, made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. And now it was the Sabbath day. When Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes, so the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. Now pay attention to how, to how blind the Pharisees are here, how hard their hearts are. So the Pharisees asked again, how have you received your sight? And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. This, Jesus does this all through the New Testament, causing division. Causing division. We'll look at that in just a minute. Verse 17 says, So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he would, was to be put out of the synagogue, excommunicated. Therefore his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether they're talking about, they're speaking about Jesus there. They're saying that Jesus is the sinner. The man answered and said, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, 
I told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us? And they cast him out. All right, so there's the... Chapter 9, the account of the man blind from birth who was healed. Now, some, some context here. Uh, for the first 40 verses. 40 verses. I'm not talking about. So a little bit of con a little bit of context here for the chapter the healing of the blind is uh, a pretty frequent miracle in Jesus ministry and it's surprisingly it's accomplished in several different ways it uses different techniques healing of the blind now why would why would this be significant why would healing of the blind be a significant sign what is Jesus trying to do he is focused at this point in his ministry on showing his his people on showing the Pharisees, showing the Jews that he is the Messiah. He is the one that was foretold in their scripture. So healing of the blind was a messianic sign. We get this in Isaiah 29, 35, 42, Matthew 11. The significance of these things, these healings is seen in the immediate context of Jesus' statement that he was the light of the world. The Jews wanted a sign. They asked for a sign. They asked over and over, what sign will you do to convince us or to show us that you have the authority to do these things when he threw the money changers out of the temple? They asked for a sign, and they got many signs. And here, once again, it only... Only Yahweh can open eyes. And here, Jesus has done it. And these religious officials cannot see. The man was made to see, but the Pharisees seem to become even more blind. So as we look at verses 1 and 2 here, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Teacher, who sinned? This man or the parents? Why was this man born blind? So, before we get... Last week when we ended up, the previous chapter uh, ended as Jesus passed by those who wanted to stone him. Just remember, Jesus is on the run <laughs> when all this happens. He's on the run. They want to kill him. They want to stone him and in chapter 8. So he's on the run. But he stops and takes the time to heal this man and give us this this account, which is rich in Christology, it's rich in soteriology. So he's running from those who want to stone him because he was. they considered him guilty of blasphemy. And uh, so John here continues the account as we go into chapter 9, noting that now Jesus passed by a man who was blind from birth. Once again, the reason, one of the reasons this is significant is because a man who was blind from birth, this is the only example of a cure of this type, and there was no possibility for this to be fraudulent. So the sense of this is, is that as, as we see Jesus on his way out of the town, away from the synagogue anyway, is that he wasn't shaken up or disturbed by the fact that they were coming to stone him. They wanted to find him. Remember at the last the 
you go at verse uh, 58 where Jesus said, I, I truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. And that's the statement that really set him off. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Going through the midst of them, it says in the KJV. Slipped away. Maybe he disappeared. Or maybe they just, they're so blind anyway. We find him calm and self-possessed, acting with a profound disregard of his enemies and their hatred. He wasn't concerned about those people. Jesus was often reviled, but he was never ruffled. One of the things worthy to be noticed about in our Lord's character is his wonderful quiet of spirit, especially his amazing calmness in the presence of those who misjudged, insulted, and slandered him. Now, there's an application that we can take for today. Now, he comes across the blind man who was sitting and begging, possibly proclaiming the fact of his having been born blind. For otherwise, the disciples would, would have no reason to ask the questions they asked. So the, the, the disciples asked the question, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So the disciples uh, look at this as some kind of puzzle, some kind of puzzle that they can't solve. They showed no interest in helping the man, but they wanted to have a theological discussion about his condition. This is, this is like us many times but Jesus will soon uh, he will soon show a different way he won't dwell on the theological puzzle but on actually helping the man Charles Spurgeon says it this way it is ours not to speculate but to perform acts of mercy and love according to the tenor of the gospel let us then be less inquisitive more practical less for cracking doctrinal nuts and more for bringing forth the bread of life to the starving multitude so it's far more important to share the gospel and evangelize than it is to debate. This is true. Now, why did, that, why did the uh, disciples ask this question? Of who sinned, this man or his parents? It was widely held that suffering, and especially such a disastrous blindness, was the result of sin. That if you were a sinner, you would get sick. You would get dread diseases. The general principle was laid down by Rabbi Ami, says there is, this is a quote, there is no death without sin and there is no suffering without iniquity. In the commentary here it says that Dodds suggested five possible reasons for these disciples to ask this question. Some of the Jews at this time believed in the pre-existence of souls. This is popular again today as a new age in Eastern mysticism finds its way into the church. But here, some of the Jews at this time believed in the pre-existence of souls and the possibility that those pre-existent souls could sin even before they came into the world. Some of the Jews at that time believed in some kind of reincarnation, or perhaps the man sinned in a previous life. Some of the Jews at that time believed that a baby might actually sin in the womb. You can see that over time these these religious legalists became so enamored with their own rules that they just forgot. They blinded themselves. They thought that the punishment was for a sin the man would later commit, perhaps, as well. And they were so bewildered that they threw out a wild possibility without even thinking it through. In fact, in their own scriptures, which we'll read in a minute from the Old Testament, and just a few minutes, we'll show you how it's very clear that God has, has, has given us the answer to this question already. Once again, proving that these Pharisees were spiritually blind and in love with their law. Now, uh, three and, uh, verses start at verse 3. Jesus answered and says, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. 
So verse 3 gives Jesus' answer to the disciples that they had asked in verse 2. Who sinned? Why is this man suffering? Sin and sickness are not automatically linked. This is what we get from Jesus' answer. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in. And problems often provide the opportunity for God's blessing. Now, this is the problem with the prosperity gospel. I'm going to share a little bit about from this book with you today. Just a little bit. I'll share it with you in just a bit. From Michael Todd. More to come on this. But this is the, the word faith movement. It is indistinguishable from New Age uh, occultism, from the uh, law of attraction. Indistinguishable. It is I don't say this lightly. It is, it is not Christianity. It's something else. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, is the answer Jesus gives. First, Jesus said that the man's blindness, essentially a birth defect, was not caused by, by some specific sin on the part of the man or his parents. Now, birth defects. At this time, it was quite common. Well, one of the most common uh, diseases at the time was gonorrhea. Gonorrhea, which means that as the, as a baby is born and passes passes through and th that area, then this uh, this disease would cause blindness in the child. Pretty common. So birth defects and other such tragedies are sometimes due to sinful behavior of the parents. Yet. Far more often, and in the case Jesus spoke here, it is due simply to sin and our fallen condition in general, not due to any specific sin. The sin of Adam set the principle of death and its associated destruction in the world, and we've had to deal with that ever since. But that the works of God should be revealed in him. Speaking to this man's situation, Jesus told them that even his blindness, was in the plan of God so that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, so let's answer the question. Why was this man born blind? There is one answer, and that is to glorify God. You might not like that answer, but that's the answer. That's the answer. That's the truth. So that God's glory could be revealed in him. Think of all the times that the, the little blind boy asked his mother, Why am I blind? Perhaps she never felt she had a good answer. Jesus explained, It's because God wants to work in and through even this. Jesus pointed the question away from why and on to the idea, What can God do in this? So, if you're having trouble, if you're suffering in some way in your life right now, here is encouragement. Here is encouragement. The, the suffering might not be easy that's why it's suffering right that's self-evident but when we can understand that suffering in our suffering god can be glorified well then that ought to be our first prayer when we feel like we're suffering asking god to use this to glorify himself because when god is glorified we as christians we benefit from that in this man's case, specific work, uh, the specific work of God would soon be revealed to heal him of his blindness. God may reveal his works in other lives, other ways, such as joy and endurance in the midst of the difficulty. God grows his church in times of great suffering. That's what we mean when we say look around the world at some of the places where oppression and suffering is at its highest, is, is high, higher than it is anywhere else in the world. That's where Christianity is growing the fastest right now. China, Africa, for example. All right, so this brings us down we, uh, almost to generational curses. Uh, we suppose that every sufferer will in the long run be made aware of his share in promoting that advance. Though today we might suffer blindly, little conscience. We have a little conscience of the privilege that we share in as we play a role in God glorifying himself in the world. So the question here is who sinned 
is so one of the common understandings here of the day for these Jews was that uh, you could be cursed. Your family could be cursed for several generations because of the sins of your fathers, as it's pointed out here. So let's look at this. Let's make sure we get this taken care of. So we have to go to Ezekiel 18 to start with here. Let's start out at, at Exodus. Let's go to the let's go to the Decalogue first and show you what we're talking about here at Exodus, Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6. Or we see right here, it says, You shall not bow down to them or serve them for the Lord. You got him a jealous God, visiting the iniquity, the sin of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So there you go. Exodus 20, verse 5. Visiting the iniquity. Cursing. The children of those sinful fathers to the third and fourth generation. So there it is, generational curses. They're real, right? Is that what that, that's, that's what that means. Let's be a little more careful. Let's go to Ezekiel. Let, what does God have to say? What, what does God have to say about his own commandment? Let's go to Ezekiel 18. What does God have to say about the way that command has been used? by his own people. Ezekiel 18 here makes it clear that God holds each individual responsible for his or her own sin. So, let's just let's look at let's look at this from it. The word of the Lord came to me. Ezekiel saying Ezekiel. What do you mean? This is the Lord speaking. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That's the sins of the fathers, cursing the children. That's the same thing. Verse 3 says, As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. The soul who sins shall die. Not the soul of the one whose father sinned, shall die, but the soul who sins shall die. It goes on. Pretty much the whole, this whole passage is about this. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife, it goes on, does not lend at interest, take any profit, withhold his withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between him, man and a man, walks in my statutes and keeps my rules by acting faithfully. He is righteous. He shall surely live, declares the Lord God. If he fathers a son who is violent, a shedder of blood, who does not any of these things, who does any of these things, sorry, though he himself did none of these things, who even eats upon the mountains, defiles his neighbor's wife, and on the same, same charges as above, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. Now suppose this man fathers a son who sees all the sins that his father has done. He sees and does not do likewise. He does not eat upon the mountains. It goes through the list again. He shall not die for his father's iniquity. He shall not die for his father's iniquity. But he shall surely live. It goes on, on and on, to make this point. So the word of the Lord came to me, as it said up above, what do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child, both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. And of course, as I shared with you, Exodus 20 verses 5 and 6, we get the verse about delivering, you know, uh, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. What does this mean? Obviously, this is a contradiction in the Bible, right? We can't trust God because there's a contradiction. Okay, slow your roll. Let's be a little careful with this. Can we determine from these passages that generational curses upon the individual is a relevant doctrine for the Christian? Will children be held responsible by God for the sins of their fathers by the sins of their parents their grandparents 
But what we learn from Ezekiel 18 and other places is that God judges the individual. In both the Old and New Testaments, God interacts with people based on their own faith. God treats Cain differently from Abel based on their different actions. So in Ezekiel 18, it goes on down here at verse 30. Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways. And then John 3.16 says, whoever, whoever believes in Jesus shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 18 in John chapter 3 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So clearly, what's in view here is salvation. Right, that's, that's what's being discussed here. So clearly, salvation is not contingent upon the actions of, of someone else. Your salvation is not contingent upon the actions or the sin of someone else. However, it is plain to see that the sins of parents do affect their children. David and Bathsheba's first son died soon after birth due to David's sin. The Israelites as a nation, now that's very important, the Israelites as a nation, when we look at Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6, it seems to be, what seems to be in view there is you're talking about a group of people. The sins of the fathers. Let's go back and look at that. the Decalogue in Exodus 20. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers. Now that's plural. On the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So, what, so a whole nation is cursed and damned? Let's be careful with it. The Israelites as a nation were punished by God for their sin. And that punishment sometimes affected the children as well. Now, that does not assume that individuals are not saved, do not have access to God's grace. Just the nation as a whole, kind of like the United States of America today. Uh, we're having the, the sins of our fathers visited upon us at the moment. It's common today to see how parental sin affects children. Those who grow up watching sinful behavior are often more likely to engage in it themselves. Parents' behavior or commitment to outside affairs, uh, affairs outside the home and away from the lives of their children certainly does inhibit their ability to be loving caregivers, and this sets the children up for possible problems in the future. So we're talking about practical things here. A parent's behavior certainly does affect the child, right? Uh, a grandparent's behavior can affect uh, a mother or a father of a child on down for a couple or, or three generations. That is clear. Things like addiction are possibly influenced by genetics as well. Even new science has suggested that, well, I thought you were anti-science, Brad. I hear that on Twitter a lot. What are you, some kind of anti-science guy? No. New science has suggested that traumas we experience can leave something called molecular scars on our DNA and that those scars are passed down genetically to the third and fourth generation. The most clear example, though, of sin affecting generations, what do you think? Let me just, just think about it. I'll give you about 10, 15 seconds. What do you think the best example of, of a, a parent or a forefather's sin affecting a whole generation or multiple generations. What's the best example of that that you can think of? You need, you need more time. It's the fall. It's the fall of Adam and Eve. That affected all of us. Their sin affected all of the generations that followed. Because of that, we are born with a sin nature. But it certainly doesn't mean that we're that we're uh, that we're anathema. It doesn't mean that we're cursed and without salvation. Adam's choice to disobey God resulted in sin being passed down or inherited. So 
So as Romans 3, 23 says, we're all affected by sin. We all were born into it. But we can be adopted into God's family and inherit a new nature. The Bible even speaks of being born again in genetic terms. Right? John, 1 John 3, 9, No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. So God forgives sin when we accept the sacrifice of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, to answer the question, is it possible for you to be cursed because of the sins of those who came before you? You got uh, people in your family involved in secret societies or whatever, do rituals. Or what, is that going to curse you somehow? Uh, it certainly can affect your life in so certain ways, but, of course, as we see, Ezekiel 18, not only Ezekiel 18, there's other good examples in the New Testament, but I think Ezekiel 18, since we're answering an Old Testament claim, let's use an Old Testament text. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are on edge. As I live, declares the Lord, this proverb shall no more be used by you. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. So, Exodus 20, verses 5 through 6, it seems to mention a group. The sins of the, father, of the fathers. So if you had that worry on your mind, if you heard someone out there on YouTube teaching it, um, generational cur uh, curse is big, it's popular, reconsider, reconsider that. Uh, what that teaching does is it sort of enslaves you. It enslaves you. Uh, you're, you're denying the sovereignty of God at that point. You're denying God's own, own word here as in, in response to that, that errant theology. So I guess it would depend on how you would define the word curse. Certainly, certainly the, the children can be affected. But if you mean by curse, possessed by demons and unable to, to receive God's grace and salvation, well, that wouldn't be a biblical teaching at all. Now, it moves on in chapter 9. We move on uh, to verse 4. So we move out of this section. Now, to verse 4, Jesus changes, he, he changes tone here, changes the topic. Verse 4, he says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. In other words, he's saying, Okay, guys. We don't have time for a theological debate right now. So he answers them and says, no, it's not that this man sinned. You know, and we, God is, it, it, it's individual. It's, it, this is the works of God might be displayed in him. This, he's blind so that God can be glorified here. And he says, now, guys, we have to move on. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day because night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. So instead of focusing on the man here as a theological puzzle to solve, Jesus saw him as an opportunity to work the works of God. Jesus sensed an urgency to do this while it was still day. What does that mean? While it was still day, he says, we have to do the work of him who sent me while it is day. This is talking about Jesus' uh, ministry, the time of his earthly ministry. This is what's meant by the day here. I must work is a marvelous statement of Jesus. The worker is a well-earned title to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the worker, the chief worker, and the example to all workers, said Charles Spurgeon. He worked under the limitations of, mor of mortality and recognized in the brevity of life another call 
to eager and continuous service. So whenever you see a man in sorrow and in trouble, the way to look at it is not to blame him and inquire how he came to be in this trouble, but to say, here's an opening for God's love. Here's an occasion for the display of the grace and goodness of the Lord. Charles Spurgeon. Now, the night is coming. What does this mean? So if the day is representing Jesus' ministry while he's there with them, the night is coming when no one can work. Jesus understood that the opportunities for service and doing good don't last forever. Jesus knew that healing this man on the Sabbath would bring greater opposition from the religious leaders who already wanted to kill him. Yet his compassion for the man drove him to do it anyway. Now this phrase here, night is coming, a comparison with, uh, with, a comparison with the very next uh, verse, verse 5, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world shows that this is obviously uh, metaphorical, uses of night and day. So, for example, in this context, night can represent the coming judgment. Night could represent a period of opportunity that ends. Night could also uh, represent here the rejection and the crucifixion of Jesus. Charles Spurgeon says, Our Lord as a man here on earth had a day. It was only a day, a short period, not very long. He could not make it longer where it was settled by the great Lord. This is what's meant by the day, the time that Jesus was here walking with the disciples. So now as we go on down here to verse 6, Having said these things, Here's where it gets interesting. Well, it's, I guess it's all pretty interesting. It gets interesting again. He spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to them, Go wash. So, when he had said these things, he spat on the ground. He did this thing where he made the mud out of dust and saliva. So, we see this in verse 6. You see it in the, uh, I guess, let's see, the KJV. How's it say it there? Yeah, it says, uh, when he had thus spoken, I'll show you. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. <laughs> made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Okay. This is a little weird for us, right? This is strange. But, context, folks. Let me offer you some context. Why would Jesus use saliva? Why would he not just grab some water? He, he made it all. He created it all. He could use anything he wanted. Why did he choose saliva? Remember who he's trying to, to, to reach specifically here. He's trying to reach these Jews, these Pharisees. These were his people. He had kept the law perfectly. He was trying to reach these people. This was... The purpose of casting out demons and, and doing these miracles were to show them that he was the one foretold in their scriptures. So what does that have to do with saliva? Well, saliva was a Jewish medical home remedy, believe it or not. It was not allowed to be used on the Sabbath. The Gospels, which is another example here, you see in verse 14 where the Pharisees charge him with this. They say, uh, now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Now the gospel records three examples of Jesus using saliva. This is Mark. Uh, this one here in John chapter 9. So let's look at the other two. Where else did Jesus do this thing that makes us uncomfortable a little bit? Mark 7, verse 33, After taking, uh, and, uh, taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And he said, looked up to heaven, and he sighed, he sighed and said to him, you know, Be opened. But he used the spit again. And then also in Mark 8, 23. 
And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, do you see anything? He opened his eyes and says, I see people. By using this accepted, even expected home remedy, method of healing, Jesus was physically encouraging this man's faith. See, the people he's healing here understand that saliva is, is a, they're used to this idea. This is not foreign to them. It's foreign to us, but not to them. He was physically encouraging this man's faith, but also deliberately challenging the Pharisees' traditions and rules, using their own traditions. He did everything possible to show them. And we'll see here in this chapter, up to this point, he has been focused, very intent, putting himself in danger, life, risking life and limb to show these Jews that he is their Messiah. But we see here in this chapter what begins to happen. We saw it in, at the end of chapter 8, and it'll continue here. Something's changing. Jesus' focus is going to shift, which is what happens to those whose hearts have been hardened. Spirit withdraws. And so Jesus begins to turn his attention away from trying to convince these to more focus on his disciples, to prepare them, to answer their questions, to get them prepared for what they're going to have to do once he has been crucified, resurrected, and ascended, and the Spirit's been poured out. So, interesting. So, by, by using the, the, the saliva here, though, we can assume that Jesus wanted to emphasize a couple things. Just as God used the dust of the ground and the clay to do a work of creation in Genesis, so Jesus did a work of creation with dust and clay for this man. So, let's think about what's significant about this. When you're saved, it's a creative work. The same creator, the same creative force that created time, space, and matter, the earth and the universe and all that, is the same force that creates the new heart, that changes you, that makes you, changes you from a lost sinner to justified, made righteous before God. And so here with this blindness, he didn't need his eyes healed. He didn't need something he didn't need surgery he needed new eyes and so when we see someone healed you're seeing regeneration that's why we use the term a regenerated christian a regenerated heart it's brand new it's not a healed old broken heart it's a new one it's not healed old blind eyes they're new it's not healed old broken legs they're brand new this is what's interesting when you see the word faith movement and these false faith healers. You don't see people getting healed. You don't see people with new eyes and new legs. Whenever someone does appear to be healed, they're still limping. It's still difficult. This is not the way Jesus healed. These people were recreated. Uh, secondly, Jesus found it important to change his methods of healing so no one could ever make a formula of the methods. The power was in God, not in the method. So the emphasis of John here seems to be on compassion, though, however, rather than creation. The touch of a friendly hand would be reassuring. The weight of the clay would serve as an indicator to the blind man that something had been done to him, and it would be an inducement to obey Jesus' command. It's a context, providing a context for the man to perhaps perform an act of faith. In his ministry to the souls of men, Jesus adopted no stereotyped approach. He dealt with each man as his particular need required. So you see, you get individual treatments, just like we get new hearts, each of us individually. Several commentators do note here that whatever what that this seems strange to us, this thing that seems strange to us using saliva as a medicine on the eyes was not so strange to the ancient world. So keep that in mind. We always say you better understand the context of what you're reading if you're going to make any applications from it 
whatsoever. In other words, if you're going to figure out what this means for my life today, you better understand who's speaking, who's being spoken to, and what are the circumstances. Know something about the people. Sadly, in these ministries, we see narcissists rather than exegesis. Narcissists means all of this is about me. Every word is about me and about my health and wealth and well-being and my dreams coming true. And of course here, once again, the virtue of the fasting saliva in the cases of disorders of the eye was well known, well known in the ancient world. Mark recorded, once again, as we just saw, there were two other versions, two other uh, examples of this healing method, Mark 7 and Mark 8. So he tells the man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. He says, in this miracle, Jesus took all the initiative. Jesus came to the blind man. The blind man did not come to him. Even so, he expected the blind man to respond with faith-filled action. The healing would not happen unless the man responded with those faith-filled, obedient actions. So this would remind us of James where uh, if upon salvation, then we're able to produce good works. Then we're able to, to do acts of faith and good works, but not before. Not many people would appreciate having mud made with spit rubbed in their eyes. Some would look at how Jesus did this miracle and object, saying that it was offensive, inadequate, or even harmful to rub mud made with spit in a man's eyes. But in the same way, some feel that the gospel is offensive. And it is. The pure gospel today is one of the most offensive suggestions you can make. That there's only one way in this world? Yeah, that's tough for people. It's true that the gospel, the gospel offends man's pride. It offends human wisdom. But it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. In the same way, some feel that the gospel is inadequate, but have all the psychiatric and political and social programs in the world. Have they done more good than the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ? When you take up a study to find out exactly what has biblical Christianity done for the world, it's amazing. It, it'll, it'll really open your eyes to the truth of God's Word and how, how it's not just some, some other religion. The impact upon the world of God's Word and uh, the existence, the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ are undeniable. In the same way that some feel the gospel is harmful, that the free offer of grace in Jesus will cause people to sin, that grace may abound, in other words, it's already been paid, so I can do whatever I want. We get that idea. We hear that some, too. But the gospel changes our life for the good and the pure, not unto wickedness. Nobody with a regenerated heart says, I'm, I'm so glad I can do whatever I want to now. Nobody says that. That's, got a, that's a, a, a truly converted Christian. All right, so the man went and washed, and this took faith. Even when Jesus didn't, uh, didn't even promise the blind man sight in the doing of this, it was surely implied that the man acted on faith even in the implied promise of Jesus. Still, as a blind man, he had to find his way down to the pool and down its steps to the pool itself. He could probably come up with a dozen reasons why he shouldn't do this. Why should just sit back down and mind his business? But he went and washed in faith and obedience because Jesus told him to and because there was mud in his eyes. And I would suggest because God drew him into the act. And he came back seeing, it says in verse 7. This is the first time in biblical record a person born blind was healed of their blindness. From Genesis to John, up to this point, no prophet, priest, or apostle ever gave sight to eyes that were born blind. Since 
Healing blind eyes is the work of the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah. It shows that Jesus is God. Once again, he's showing these hard-hearted Pharisees who he is. It's only the Lord that opens the eyes of the blind. You see in Psalm 146, opening the eyes of the blind was prophesied to be a work of the Messiah. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, it says in Isaiah 35, 5. So the man came back seeing. The word rendered here uh, for, for sight is literally recovered sight. The underlying text here, the term means recovered sight, new sight, sight being natural to men. The deprivation of it is regarded as a loss, and the reception of it, though never enjoyed before, as a recovery. Now, just as the, uh, as the important man of chapter 5, which we saw earlier, who was cured after 38 years of his sickness at the pool of Bethesda, as this man may be viewed as a type of the Jews who are yet to be healed, so may this man of chapter 9, who was blind from birth, be viewed as a type of the Gentiles who, whose healing was about to begin and who were about to believe into Jesus as him who was the sent from God. That pool at Siloam, that word Siloam means sent. And isn't it interesting that the sickness that's being healed here right in front of the eyes of these Pharisees is blindness as they stand spiritually blind watching this man or seeing this man who has been healed of blindness and they still can't see. What does this tell us, folks? This tells us that God does the drawing. God is the one who changes the heart. So let's talk about healing for just a minute. Not all those who are healed in the, in the New Testament were simultaneously saved. Now this is interesting, difficult to get your head around. Not all of those who are healed in the New Testament were at least at that moment, saved. For example, but came to trust Christ and have eternal life. So physical healing is a poor substitute for spiritual salvation. Of course, in the word faith movement and prosperity gospel, which is the new apostolic reformation, everywhere. We see this in most churches today. Some of these ideas are in there that physical healing is something that is just a part of salvation. But physical healing is a poor substitute for spiritual salvation. Miracles are only truly helpful when they bring us to God. But we see people out there uh, asking for miracles, even being told, suggested to imagine these things you want to happen so that God can do it for you. Right, because God needs to wait on us before He can act. Right, God needed to wait on us before He could create the universe. Right, so you see how ridiculous that is. All humans live in a fallen world and bad things happen. God often chooses not to intervene. But this says nothing about His love and concern. After all, He did create it. Be careful of demanding that God act miraculously for every little need we have in this current evil age. He is sovereign, and we do not know the full implications of any given situation. And let me just tell you this. Beware of any teacher or pastor who encourages you to employ your imagination as a means for causing miracles to occur in your life on your behalf. Beware, avoid any teacher or pastor who encourages you to employ your imagination as a way to grow your faith. Now, why do I say this? Why do I say that it's such a bad thing? Why is it so bad for me to stand on my imagination, for me to visualize what it is that I want? Well, first of all, it's, it's occultism. But, but, let's look at this. Jeremiah 17, 9. Now the heart. The heart is the mind. That is where your imagination is, the heart, the mind. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? 
So when you have a pastor or a teacher out there telling you that you need to, you need to imagine what it is you want. Think of it. Visualize it in your head. In fact, let me just pull some quotes out of here today. And uh, so he's got, uh, Michael Todd has three steps. Listen, I, we, this book just came out Tuesday. We'll be getting into this. You'll be seeing more of this very soon because uh, it has to be responded to. Making faith field declarations. Things like this. He says that words are so powerful that they are the tool God used to create the entire universe. That's a description of creation. That is not a command, right? Descriptive and prescriptive. We find, as we read Scripture, we need to understand what we're reading. Is what we're reading a description of something or prescribed, something that we should do? We see this in the Pentecost, in the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in, in, the, in Acts, in the book of Acts. Is that, the pouring out of this Pentecost, is that amazing revival, is that prescriptive or descriptive? Are they, is that a description of something that happened or is that a, or is that prescribing, commanding something that we're, are we supposed to, to initiate revivals according to our own will, wherever we want to see one? Understand, when you're reading scripture, is what I'm reading a description or a command? So, Michael Todd says here, Words are so powerful that they are the tool God used to create the entire universe. That is a description of creation. It's not a command of how we get what we want in the world. He says, words have creative power, and God chose to give that same power to you and me. Did he? Can I get a chapter and verse? Okay, he's going to give us one. Let's go. Let's go here to... He's going to use Proverbs 18.21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Okay, descriptive or prescriptive? Is something being described here, or is there some kind of command here? It's a description. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So what he uses here, he says, we have creative power, and God chose to give us that same power. He chose to give it to you and me. Creative power. And he's using Proverbs 18.21 as the proof text. He says, according to Proverbs 18.21, the power of life and death lies not in your thoughts, but in your tongue. And remember, faith comes by hearing, he says. As you echo faith-filled words that are based on God's word, your own ears are the first to hear and receive them. When you speak the truth, your faith grows. The moment you start speaking the answer out loud, the worry and doubt have that have tried to consume your mind begin to burn away as your faith is kindled into flame. This is the secret. This is uh, the law of attraction. I don't, when I say this is the secret, I don't mean this is, we've discovered it. That's a thing called the secret. A book, a, a documentary that came out many years ago that promoted the law of attraction, uh, which says essentially if you say positive affirmations, then good things will happen to you. If you say negative things, then negative things will happen to you. The only problem with that is, is that message don't preach everywhere. That message might preach somewhere where affluence is common. But go into Afghanistan and try to preach that gospel. Try to preach that message. It doesn't work. It only works where people are affluent and have plenty of money to give to people who want to tickle their ears. So, Michael Todd gives us, a, he gives us a method, a method for how we can grow our faith and have our dreams come true. By the way, let me remind, this is a pastor of a, uh, of, a, of a church in Tulsa, Oklahoma called uh, Transformation Church, I believe it is. Um, they're in a, a facility that costs $50 million to build. They bought it for $10 million. This is no, this ain't no chump. This is no side game here. This is in the middle. This is mainstream today. This is mainstream Christianity today. So let's see. What is the method here? He says, I want you to tap into that God-given faith visualization tool of yours, which is your imagination. 
Let me remind you. Here's what you should think about your imagination. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You can't trust your imagination. You can't trust your own heart. That's why you need a new one. He says, get a picture in your mind of something you are believing God to manifest in your life. Right? doesn't say anything about making sure that's according to God's will or anything like that. Just whatever you want. Step two, where he says, actually, step one, he continues this, what do you see? Are you visualizing it? What do you see? What do you hear? What prayer has God answered in the future that you envision? This is witchcraft, my friend. Step two, he says, now, I want you to say something positive about it, as if you're really there in that moment watching it happen. This is occultism. This is, a, this is how rituals are done. He says, imagine that the multiple obstacles have all suddenly and miraculously been removed. Take a deep breath and receive that reality. How about that? And then express your gratitude to the God who already made it happen. So that's three steps. Visualize. Speak, receive, and be grateful. He says, stating aloud what God is doing and promises to do allows me to see my life and issues from His perspective. Really? You can see from God's perspective. That's amazing. No human being's ever been able to do that, <laughs> except for you. But he goes on to say, He has. It reminds me to praise our omnipotent God in advance for the miracle He has yet to bring to pass and encourages my faith to trust that He actually will make it happen for me. You want to destroy this whole theology in one statement? What if you can't speak? What if I'm someone who, for some reason, birth defect, mental disorder, a horrible accident. What if I can't speak? My vocal cords are damaged and I can't speak. Well, what do I do then? Pastor Todd. If I can't speak these things into existence, then I guess I'm just not saved. He says, too many Christians think faith-filled thoughts once in a while, but don't put their weight on it by making faith-filled declarations says, thinking about faith isn't enough. You've got to speak the language of faith. He says, confession is not something you think, it's something you say. And once again, he goes here, and for his context, he's using Romans chapter 10, verse 9. The context of making a confession. This has nothing to do, Romans 10, 9, has nothing to do with personal gain or your dreams coming true. Confessing Christ in the first century sense means something that could get you killed. It means it does mean stating it, but it means stating it to those who are questioning you and are asking you to honor Caesar as Lord, and you don't do it. Then you confess Christ as Lord, and then they might just kill you for it. Now, you see, in this book, we'll be getting back into this more uh, later. Because this is, uh, this is brand new, it's just fresh out, and I want to make sure that somebody out here deals with it. I don't want him to slip through the cracks. I want him to get his, you know, his uh, full attention. He's out there seeking attention, so let's give him some. In love, right? We don't want to attack these people. We want to show them the error, and there's so much of it there. And I worry that you, people out there... Well, hear someone like this speak, and you'll be so jazzed up by what you hear that you might just fall into the trap thinking that's Christian. It's not. It's doctrines of devils. It is, sadly, doctrines of demons. And the, the reason that it works and the reason that they can pay their building off $10 million in a year or two years, whatever, is because people love 
They love this message. What do we know about the gospel in the world? It's offensive. People generally don't love it. So we'll deal with more of that later. But now there are uh, many questions that we would like to ask these New Testament writers about healing. One subject all believers think about is physical healing. So we see in, in, uh, in the book of Acts, Paul is able to heal. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Corinthians 12 and Philippians 2, he seems unable to heal. Why are some healed and not all? And is there a time window connected to healing which has closed, like the apostolic period? Well, according to Pastor Michael Todd here, your faith wasn't big enough. That's why you're sick. We can certainly affirm that we have a supernatural, compassionate Father who has and does heal physically as well as spiritually. But why is this healing aspect seemingly present and then noticeably absent? For example, from modern Western churches. Most certainly, it is not connected to human faith. That's what this teaches. You conjure faith inside yourself, aside from God. Right? God's waiting for you to act. Right? God couldn't create the universe without your help. Right? Most certainly, it's not connected to human faith. Obviously, Paul had faith, yet suffered a thorn in his flesh. Couldn't heal itself. Healing and believing miracles uh, affirmed the truthfulness and validity of the gospel. When we see Jesus healing and doing miracles, it was for the purpose of affirming the gospel. Not miracles so that I can pay off my mortgage in a year. Healing and believing miracles affirm the truthfulness and validity of the gospel. That's the purpose of miracles healings, which it still does in the areas of the world where it is first proclaimed even today. God wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is clearly a gift from God and not something we can conjure up with our imagination or our effort. Well, what's your chapter and verse on that, Brad? Okay. Well, let's just do, you know, those of you who watch this often, you know, we, are end, up, we end up in Ephesians 2 a lot. You were dead in the trespasses. You were dead. That's plain. No, no trickiness about that. It's necros in the Greek, dead. You were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work and the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. This, is, this was all of us carrying out the desires of the body. That's... That's what that message is telling you to do, to carry out the desires of the body. What can you conjure in your mind that you want? What do you really want? Hey, if you want a new car, if you want a better job, you better believe for that thing. Really? Is that what miracles are for? But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised up with Him and seated with us, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So when someone says you can grow your faith by imagining, man, that's the adversary talking. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's some other spirit. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works. Not a result of your imagination. Why? So that no one may boast. So that no one is more important than any other. Because we're His workmanship. He made us. We didn't make Him. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
According to this doctrine, God is dependent upon man. The Creator is dependent upon His creation. You tell me, when you see a potter sitting at a potter uh, at his wheel and he's making a pot or a vessel, did the vessel make the potter? Does the vessel in any way influence what the potter does with the clay? That's what they're trying to teach, that somehow the pot, the clay, can change the potter, can influence the potter. Also, physical illness is often allowed to happen in believers' lives. Why? We've already learned that. For God's glory. You might, be in, you, you might be experiencing that in your own family. You might have a child in your family who, who, with autism. You might have a mother or a father or a family member who is really suffering and firm. Physical illness is often allowed in the lives of believers. Why? Could be a temporal punishment for sin as consequences of life in a fallen world or to help believers mature spiritually. Remember, this is not our home. We ought not be seeking our reward here. Our prayer should be for God's will to be done in each case. Healing was a significant aspect of the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. It was intended primarily to confirm what was healing and miracles. What were they for? Primarily intended to confirm the radically new message about God and His kingdom. These miracles showed up hot and heavy for a, for a, for a while to make a point so that the gospel would be proclaimed, accepted, understood, so that these hard-hearted Jews might be saved it's it shows the heart of god for people who are hurting healing shows the heart of god for people who are hurting and god has not changed malachi 3 6 and he still acts in love in healing there are examples where the healing of those with great faith did not take place we see this. Paul in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. Trophimus in 2 Timothy 4. Sin and sickness were associated in rabbinical thought with sin, as we saw earlier in the chapter. Healing is not a guarantee of the new covenant for Christians. It's not part of the atonement as described in Isaiah 53 or uh, Psalm 103, where healing is imagery for forgiveness. There is a true mystery about why some people are healed and some are not. It's possible that although healing is present in every age, there was a significant increase during Jesus' lifetime. That this increase would possibly occur again just before His return. As with most biblical issues, here we see two extremes. So when we see this happen, when we see two extremes we need to walk in the light that we have, what we know, in love, but always open to more light from God's Word and from His Spirit. Now, uh, in uh, verse 8, let's go back to the chapter here now. Go back to John chapter 8. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? So they... they there's a controversy here. Is this really him? Has he really been healed? So these neighbors, the neighbors, that's the term they use here, and those who had previously had seen that this, that this was the blind man, they were confused. Let's get on down here to verse 13. So they brought to the Pharisees this man who had formerly been blind, and it was a Sabbath day. And Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. They brought him who was formerly blind. 
And he goes on here to say, So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others said, How, can, how could he do this if he was a sinner? And there was a division among them. Now this is what we see. Jesus seems to always cause this. Right? What Jesus is being preached at your church? Jesus, the truth causes division. Let's look at some examples here. This is John, we'll go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? Division. John chapter 7, verse 43. So there was a division among the people over Jesus. What, what, is, what is Jesus? What does the gospel cause? It causes division. Why? Why? Well, let's go back over here. It's Jeremiah 17. The gospel causes division because the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately sick. And we can't understand it. We want our way, our will to be done. We see also, let's see, Gospel of John chapter 10. Uh, chapter 10, verse 19. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. These words that Jesus said. They even tried to say that he had a demon. Also, Matthew 10, verse 34. Here we go. The Lord Jesus is speaking himself. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring, to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against their mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life here, whoever finds his life here will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, poor in spirit, humble, will find it. So, what Jesus is being preached in your church. The unifying, the Jesus that unifies everyone no matter what their religion is, no matter what the doctrine is, or the Jesus that brings a sword. Do not think that I've come to bring, to, to bring peace on earth. Not come to bring peace, but a sword looks like anyway that the underlying Greek word there looks like where we get our word machete so that's not a it's not a it's talking about a blade no metaphor there yes of course it's a metaphor but it's effective it's divisive that the, the action is clear it's cutting separates separates one from the other separates the sheep from the goats the dark from the light So back here in the chapter, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. So they, there was a division among them. Of course, Jesus creating division just, from, just, just by doing miracles. One of the questions was, how could a sinner do these miraculous things? He can't be a sinner. Sounds like perhaps something that maybe Nicodemus would have said to Jesus or said earlier to Jesus. No one could perform the miracle, the miraculous signs that that you're doing if God were not with him. Earlier, back in chapter three, verses seventeen and eighteen. And so they said again to the blind man, "What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes?" And he said, "He's a prophet." 
Now, so we can see this man's his 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 understanding. His doctrine is growing. He didn't know Jesus before. So answer me this. If it requires great faith to be healed, how does this man here who never heard of Jesus get healed? If it requires me conjuring up great faith and imagining, well, how did this man get healed? Well, he never heard of Jesus. This stuff falls apart immediately upon inspection. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. And of course, the man, he's, his, his understanding is growing. So he's a prophet. I didn't know him before. I understand clearly he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. So questions and divisions this chapter shows the development of this blind man's faith. This man who was blind, born blind, you show the, see the development of his faith here. Even on down with uh, verses 36, and, uh, let's see here, 36 and 38. He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? As Jesus, is, Jesus, Jesus asked the man, Do you believe in the Son of Man? So they'd already heard that they had cast the man out, having found him. Jesus asked him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man answered, the man who was formerly blind, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He says, It's, it's, it's me, the one who's standing before you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. What happened there? Jesus accepted the worship. Those who like to claim that Jesus never said he was God, never claimed to be God, never did anything to show that he was God, he accepted worship that was intended for God. Right here in verse 38, 39, Jesus says, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. That's the difference between those Pharisees with the hard heart and those with the new heart. It's a measure of their perplexity and division back here in verse 17. That they ask the man what he thinks of Jesus. Normally they would not have dreamed of putting a question on a religious issue to a man who was not of their learning, for example. Jesus did not specifically say to this man that he would be healed if he washed in the pool. But... It was implied in the action. Though Jesus was not present when the man actually gained his sight, one could say that Jesus prophesied that he would gain his sight if he did what Jesus told him to do. So back in verse 11, all the man knew about Jesus was his name. Here, the healed man proclaimed... Now, once again, all the man knew about Jesus was his name. And that's because he had just heard it. He you know, knew nothing about Jesus, but there he was, healed Healed. He had no faith. <laughs> so when you get people claiming that you need to have big, huge faith, just remember that mustard seed. You don't have any faith. You don't have any righteousness. Where does faith come from? For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Now, according to a Jewish maxim, a prophet might dispense with the observation of the, sa of the Sabbath. Could, if he was recognized as such, he could do whatever he needed to do. If they allow that Jesus was a prophet, then even in their sense, he might be allowed to break the law of the Sabbath and be guiltless. But the Jews did not believe concerning him the man, that he had been blind, it was easier for the religious leaders to believe that the man was never really blind at all than to believe that Jesus healed the man, even though all the evidence was to the contrary, their hearts were still hard. So we go down to verse 19, or the start of 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind. Verse 19 says, and ask them, is this your son? So the parents come in and the Jews ask them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How does he then now see? The religious leaders asked the parents to verify that the man was truly born blind. The tone of their question implies that they wondered if the parents were part of some 
conspiracy. Yet the parents verified this is our son and he was born blind. This should have been enough to persuade the religious leaders that a remarkable man from God was in their presence. But it didn't persuade them at all. And they continued to be hostile, to interrogate the man who had been healed and his, his parents. So the parents, they ask again, and his parents worried, fearful of being called on the carpet in the synagogue. They say, we... Uh, we don't know how or who opened his eyes. They could identify it was their son and that he was born blind, but they would not speak to the question of how he was healed because of the threat of themselves being excommunicated out of the synagogue. So the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, that he would be kicked out out of the synagogue, which is a big deal in this community you're set you're you're an outcast from the whole community at that point what is excommunication ezra 10 8 an old testament example of excommunication in the commentary dodd wrote of the practice of the ancient jewish world of excommunication where there were three degrees the first lasted for 30 days then followed a second admonition and if Impenitent, the culprit was punished for 30 more days, and if still impenitent, he was laid under the cherim or ban, which was indefinite of indefinite duration, which entirely cut him off from intermixing with the community, anyone else in the community. He was treated as if he were a leper. Many of the rulers in Jerusalem really believed in Jesus, but were afraid to say it because they didn't want to be excommunicated. And that is, we see that today. Many people don't want to be marginalized from our very comfortable society. It's much easier to deny Jesus today. In the modern Western world, the idea of excommunication doesn't mean very much to us because it's easy for the excommunicated to simply go to another church or another community and pretend that nothing happened. More common today is what one might call self-excommunication, where believers separate themselves from church worship and life with no good reason. So for the second time, they called the man who, had, who was blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man, they're talking about Jesus, is a sinner. So they begin to interrogate the man again, and he offers this very simple testimony. So the man answers and says, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind. Now I see. The testimony can't be any simpler or pow more powerful than that. And what this reminds us of, what does this remind you of? Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know is that I was blind and now I see. So that brings us right here. Let's share these lyrics because clearly this is what uh, John Newton had in mind when he wrote the, when he wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace. Dangers, toils, and 
his grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home the lord has promised good to me his word my hope secure flesh and heart shall fail and mortal life shall cease I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine that is uh, rich Oh, that is uh, Amazing Grace by Rich Tuttle. You can find Rich Tuttle on SoundCloud. That was, uh, so you, you'll find that we, he, he had more verses than were available there on our screen. But what we, the reason I wanted to share that with you today is because, you know, a lot of music, a lot of music showing up in the church today. And, you know, not, not, that, all, not that there's anything wrong with new music, but here we get an example of a song that glorifies God. Why? Because it's founded firmly on His Word. Um, firmly and totally on His Word. You can find that there's, there's theology, biblical theology, in these words. In this lyric, the mighty fortress, uh, the one we played at the opening of the show today. Same thing. So we want to be careful, you know, be careful about what we allow uh, into, our, into our worship let it be you know if you're worried and you're not sure just stand on that stand on that these uh, uh, traditional songs that are clearly founded on uh, on God's word and not man's not not our not our desire to make things cool and interesting the gospel is always going to be offensive even when it's in a song So uh, that pulls us to the next point here. Let's get back over here to there. We go. So that brings us into the next piece here, where we're talking about uh, faith, belief, and trust. Which is an extremely important term that we find. In scripture Hebrews 11 1 gives us uh, understanding of faith let's look at that right from the top here now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen KJV I'll show you that one so I kind of prefer the KJV here on this one now faith is the substance the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now you've probably heard me say this here before. What I my definition of faith that I took that I've borrowed from Cliff Neckley. I, I hope he doesn't mind, but it's perfect. I think it's really good. Faith, this gift that God gives us, is is evidence of reliability. We can see it. God, that God's reliable. We can see it in the creation. We can see it in His Word. Faith is evidence of reliability. Plus my commitment to it. That's a that's a definition of faith from a from a person's perspective, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily a full description of faith. But when we try to put it in human words, it's just, uh, 
our faith is reasonable. We have, every, we have good reason. We have all sorts of evidence. We don't believe blindly, in other words. There's plenty of evidence. So it's an important term, faith, belief, trust. It's the subject of Jesus' early preaching, for sure. There are at least two new covenant requirements, repentance and faith. Requirements, repentance and faith. And, and that both of those, repentance and faith, are not things that you can do. They are gifts. Scripture tells us this over and over. Etymology of the word faith that we find in the New Testament uh, or in the Old Testament, uh, the term that is translated into the, the English word faith in the Old Testament, that term meant loyalty, fidelity, it's uh, trustworthiness. And this is a description of God's nature, not yours. It is God's nature, not yours. All we can uh, pray for is for God to fill us with His Spirit so that we can live in His will. And through us, loyalty, fidelity, and trustworthiness can be seen in the biblical sense. It came from a Hebrew term which originally meant to be sure or stable, like a foundation. Saving faith is a person to welcome, a, a, person, a personal trust. Believing truths about that person, living a life like that person. For example, Christ-likeness. So, saving faith. To be sure, stable. In the Old Testament sense, saving faith is a person to welcome, personal trust and faith, believing truths about that person, we get that from Scripture, or living a life like that person, Christ-likeness. So it's emphasized, it should be emphasized, that Abraham's faith was in God's promise of a child and descendant. Abraham responded to this promise by trusting in God. Believe, trust, faith, and faithfulness in the Old Testament. He still had doubts and concerns regarding this promise. We see that clearly. Which took 13 years to be fulfilled. His imperfect faith, however, was accepted by God. So God is willing. So all of us have an imperfect faith because we're still here in the flesh. But God is willing to do work with flawed human beings who respond to Him and His promises in faith, even if it's the size of a mustard seed. That's Matthew 17. So when you get people telling you that you need to have a big, huge, great faith for your dreams to come true, Matthew 17, 20 seems to contradict that in a big way. Or even mixed faith. It's what God can work with. But he doesn't need to wait on you. New Testament usage of the word faith. The term believe is from a Greek, a Greek verb, pistua, pisteo, the noun pistis, which is translated into English as believe, faith, or trust. For example, the noun doesn't occur in the Gospel of John, but the verb is used in here. John uh, chapter 2, verses 23 and 25, there's uncertainty as to the genuineness of the crowd's commitment to Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. Other examples of this superficial use of the term believe are John chapter 8, which last week, and uh, Acts chapter 8. But true biblical faith is more than an initial response. It must be followed by a process of discipleship, ongoing, progressive sanctification. And this is crucial. Faith or believing has nothing to do with this term we hear, believing for something. I want this thing to happen. I think this thing should happen, so I'm going to believe for it. We don't find that in the Bible. Special requests, right? We don't get that. We don't, we don't get the indication that our will needs to be done anywhere. Faith or belief is a gift from God her, the receiving of the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation. Salvation is the point. 
That's the whole point. Not having my desires satisfied or my personal dreams coming true. Your preacher shouldn't be, shouldn't sound like Tony Robbins or a self-help guru. It should sound like the Apostle Paul. It should sound like Timothy or Titus. All right, so go back here to the chapter. Verse 24. And they claim, once again, they say, we know this man is a sinner. They're talking about, talking about Jesus. There we go. And he answered whether he's a sinner or not. I don't know. One thing I do know is I was blind and now I can see. So it was frustrating for the, 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 those men interrogating this man that neither of those statements could be refuted. The former statement was confirmed by the evidence of the parents. The truth of the latter statement they could see for themselves. They could see. So why wouldn't they just admit to the conclusion to which these two facts pointed? Because their hearts were hard. They hadn't been drawn by God. They were still in love with their law. From time to time, Christians are confronted with questions that are meant to embarrass or mock. Questions about some science or social issue or another. One doesn't have to be an expert in all those things, though the more one knows, it's better. More than anything, we can simply say, I don't know about all that. But this I do know. Once I was blind, now I see. We don't base our faith on personal experience. We base it on God's truth, which is revealed to us in His Word. That's where the truth comes from. Yet our experience of God's work in our life is an important and persuasive additional support for our faith and the faith of others. To be able to truly claim, I was blind and now I see, is really a powerful argument. Verse 26, they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered him and said, I've told you already. And you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? So now we get to the point here, which is pretty, uh, uh, I, I like this section of the, of the chapter. Because we see this man, he's just being honest. And they keep asking him the same question, hoping for a different answer. And he just, I think he's filled with a righteous indignation told you already and you didn't listen to me why do you want to hear it again do you also want to be disciples of jesus so he knew at this point <laughs> he was treading on thin ice he was about to be excommunicated so the tone implies the tone in which they were speaking to him implies harsh intense interrogation they demanded answers from this man who could now see i'll give you this anecdotally this sounds like when we're told to when we're brought before the courts or the or you're brought before uh, men to be questioned about your faith don't don't worry about what you'll say the spirit will give it to you in that moment it kind of sounds like that might be what's happening to this guy here i told you already and you didn't listen so the man born blind showed a simple and profound wisdom in his back and forth perhaps perhaps god was Perhaps this is an example of that, where the, where the words come to him. He showed a simple and profound wisdom in his back and forth with the esteemed and educated religious leaders. If they kept asking the same question, they would keep hearing the same answer. As the mercy of God had given him his sight, so the wisdom of God taught him how to escape the snares that these men were laying for him. So he asked them, do you also want to become his disciples? Intending to or not here, the healed man mocked both their prejudiced rejection of Jesus and proclaimed himself to be a disciple of Jesus. Because he said, do you also? So this man was a believer. He now displays 
uh, a capacity that hadn't been seen before for irony. He was able to, it hadn't shown it before that he was able to, to verbally spar with, the, with these scholars. But here, he's holding his own very well. Man did not really expect that these men were so plainly opposed to Jesus, that these men who were so opposed to Jesus were going to change their minds, but he was quite ready to bait them. So after wisely answering these religious leaders, the man is excommunicated. And you know, not lightly. This doesn't happen lightly. He, did, this is, he had to truly be changed, regenerated, new heart. Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses, so they go on with this. But as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. And then the, the man who was born blind said, Wow, this is an amazing thing. You don't know where he comes from. Yet he healed me. He saved me. He opened my eyes. He cured my blindness. And you don't know who he is? Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sin, and you're trying to teach us. And so they cast him out. The healed man said this. That's a marvelous thing. How don't you how, how do you not know who this man is? He said this about their unbelief, not about the miracle of Jesus. This it was if he told the religious leaders, your unbelief and ignorance in the face of this evidence is more miracle than even my cure. So excellent. Excellent retort. That you don't even know where he's from is emphatic, may even carry a little bit of irony here. Like you, these religious experts, you can't even work out a simple thing like this? You can't see this? Verse 31 says, We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So as a well-brought-up Jew, the man regards it, regards it uh, as obvious that a miracle wrought in answer to a prayer is proof that its worker is no sinner. No divine help is available for impenitent sinners. And there's an application for us today. No divine help is available for those who are outside the faith. The man's statement was, in one sense, true, and in another sense, false. God is certainly under no obligation to hear the prayer of the man or the woman who is in rebellion against him. Yet, in his mercy and for his ultimate wise purpose, he may hear the unrepentant sinner. Yet, the man's statement was completely true in this sense. He said, if Christ had been an imposter, then it's not possible to conceive that God would have listened to his prayer and given him the power to open the man's blind eyes. And then they respond to him once again, You were completely born in sin, in verse 34. And you're trying to teach us? So these religious leaders despise the common people anyway. And they despise this man too. They were especially angry because he was right. They were wrong. And they cast him out. They excommunicated the blind man, the man who used to be blind. Difficult as it was, this turned out to be a good thing because he would shortly be far more connected to Jesus. The casting out of this man meant his excommunication from the religious rites in temple and synagogue. The religious leaders treated him terribly, for sure. They abused him, they insulted him, and they rejected him. So he's just like Jesus in that sense. 
That's exactly how they treated Jesus. They cast him out. They abused him. They insulted him, and they rejected him. So he's, in that sense, connected to Jesus. They have said since many followers in their crimes, a false religion supported by the state has, by fire and sword, silenced those whose truth, in the end, annihilated the system of their opponents. Jesus heard that they had cast the man out, and having found him, Jesus said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And this comes to a big crescendo here. Jesus asks the man, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And still, innocently, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him. It is me, the one who's standing before you. Jesus called on the healed man to fully believe, and he did. He said, Lord, I believe. When the healed man declared his loyalty to Jesus by not denying him before the hostile religious leaders, he was rewarded. When Jesus revealed more of himself, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Personal relationship. So the question here, do you believe in the Son of Man, is a summons to commitment. So this question is, in the context, is doubly emphatic. It demanded a personal decision in the face of opposition or rejection. He was under pressure. But Jesus dealt with this man differently than he did most people. He met his physical need first, then allowed him to endure persecution. To get the application for your life today. He met his physical need first, then he allowed him to endure persecution, then called him to a specific belief. It's good to remember that God may work differently in our lives. Some manuscripts have Son of Man here instead of Son of God, but both terms point to God's Messiah, the one who should be believed and trusted. And it says here, um, verse 38, he said, Lord, I believe, and worshipped him. The religious leader said, you can't worship with us at the temple. And Jesus said, I will receive your worship. Their worship is empty. So when the man worshipped Jesus, Jesus received the worship. This is something that no man or angel in the Bible ever does. The fact that Jesus accepted this worship is another proof that Jesus was and is God. And that he knew himself to be God. So the formerly blind man showed an increasing awareness. Once again, we see this man's faith expanding throughout this passage, throughout this chapter. His awareness of Jesus goes from verse 11, where he knows that Jesus is a man. Verse 17, where now he says, oh, this is a prophet. Verse 27, he says, Jesus is my master. I am his disciple. In verse 33, he says, Jesus is from God. Verse 35 through 38, Jesus is the Son of God. Verse 39, Jesus is who I trust. And also, Jesus is who I worship. This is the progression that we see in this man. Some of the Pharisees near heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. So Jesus is going to distinguish here between the blind and the seeing. And this is the, the big finish in this. Jesus said, uh, For judgment I've come into this world. John recorded these words of Jesus as part of a larger theme in his gospel. Also, the main uh, theme here we get from the gospel of John altogether. We'll look at that right quick. Chapter 20, we talked about this in the very first episode, very first video. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Why has John written this? Why did the Holy Spirit inspire this gospel? Chapter 20, 
verses 30 and 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So what is the point of these miracles? What is the point of these healings? Is it descriptive or prescriptive? Is it telling us that this is what we should be doing? Or is it describing is it describing our condition and how we come to faith? In this sense, Jesus is like the continental divide in the Rocky Mountains, a single place where an entire path is decided. Jesus is the pivot on which human destiny turns from the commentary here. His statement that he had come to judge the world meant that he would be the one who separates, the one through whom God would judge. Those who have no spiritual vision They who have no spiritual vision by are conscious of their need of it, and they which see means, they who wrongly suppose that they are already that they already possess spiritual vision. That's what's mean here by if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But you say you know, so you are guilty. Those who do not see may see. Those who are conscious of their blindness and grieved on account of it may be relieved. While those who are content with the light they have, they lose even that. We ought not suffer any person to perish for lack of knowing the gospel. We cannot give men eyes, but we can give them light. How do you do that? You reflect it. You reflect the light of Christ that we find in His Word. In saying those who do not see, Jesus used blindness in a spiritual metaphorical sense of those who cannot see the light and truth of God, especially as it is revealed in Jesus Christ. One may say that this entire chapter paints a picture of how Jesus heals blind souls. We're all spiritually blind from birth. Jesus takes the initiative in healing us from blindness. It's His work, not ours. Jesus does a work of creation in us. He doesn't reform us. We're made new. In this work, we must be obedient to what Jesus commands. Jesus commands us to be washed in the water of baptism. We become a mystery to our former associates, not even seeming to be the same person. Remember, they, people didn't recognize, is this really even the same man? We display loyalty to Jesus when we are persecuted, boldly and plainly testifying of His work in our lives, and this confounds other people who don't know Jesus. It causes them to ask the question, what does that person have that I don't have? We pass from little knowledge to greater knowledge, and this brings us to greater worship and adoration. We never know the name of this man in this chapter, the one who was born blind and made to see. That's because Jesus is the one who's important here. A true disciple is content to remain anonymous if his Lord gets the glory are we blind also they say Pharisees here say are we also blind Pharisees sneered at Jesus confident in their own spiritual sight which was blindness because they couldn't even see son of God who was right in front of them here's Charles Spurgeon he says take a homely illustration from myself I used to be very backward in using spectacles for some time because I could almost see without them, and I didn't wish to be an old gentleman too soon. But now that I cannot read my notes at all without wearing spectacles, I put them on without a moment's hesitation. I don't care whether you think me old or not. So when a man comes to feel thoroughly guilty, he doesn't mind depending on God. And that's the beauty of Spurgeon's writing there. If you were blind, you would have no sin. You would have no guilt, it says in verse 31. They, they could be forgiven and set free, but because they say, we see, their sin remains. So there's a great difference between the one who is blind and knows it and the one who simply shuts his eyes. Willful ignorance is what you're calling that. 
To be so self-deceived as to shut one's eyes to the light is a desperate state to be in. The light is there, but if people refuse to avail themselves of it, rather deliberately reject it, how can they ever be enlightened? How can they ever receive the truth? There's, there's more evidence that it's not us, that we're not participating in salvation, that it's done for us. As Jesus said, their sin remains. All right, so that's fantastic. Uh, it was a lot of fun. So let's, uh, we've got a couple questions here to run down. Um, just to, so we can review. That was, that was a lot. That went for a while. That, how long did that go for? Not too bad. A couple hours, a little over a couple hours. Very happy to see that a lot of you have remained here today. We've got, a, we've got half the audience we had Tuesday. I guess, uh, you know, when you hold up black goo and Jesus, people were going to pick black goo. More people were going to go for black goo. What does that tell you? What does that tell you about YouTube or our world? So anyway, <laughs> that's an interesting... It's, it's always fascinating to see even how people respond to titles and thumbnails out there.